the tail stops wagging the dog and the dog starts wagging the tail. They now have to keep printing or we crash. We've got this ticking time bomb. Talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Welcome to Live from the Vault. Welcome to Live from the Vault. My name is Shane Moran and I'll be your host for this episode. And as you can see, I'm not in the vault. I'm out of the vault and in Dubai where they absolutely love gold. And from the entire, entire Live from the Vault team worldwide, uh, we want to thank you for your continued support. And as you can imagine, this community just keeps growing thanks to you. And the Live from the Vault community, just uh, we, we really appreciate you. Now, there's a lot to talk about during these historic times, and fear not, because we have the one and only Andrew McGuire in the house, and we'll be talking gold. And this is going to be an amazing episode, so fasten your seatbelts. You're going to love it. Uh, you know, Live from the Vault gives you access to information and updates that you just can't get anywhere else, and this episode is going to be no exception. And with that, let's head over to the UK and talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Hey, Shane from Dubai. Nice to see you again, my friend. You know what, Andrew? They love gold in Dubai. Everybody wants to talk about gold. Can you imagine that? <laughs> well, I imagine that you get them talking about silver sometimes, do you? Yeah, yeah I do, but, I, but I'm in Dubai and they love... They, you know, I'm a silver guy, so I'm an outsider here, but uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. They love they love gold. It's everywhere. But, Andrew, as usually, you know, we, we start with a summary uh, of the action since our last episode. Now, we recorded last time on September 24, uh, 21st, and can you just bring all of our viewers up to date in terms of what you see at the start right here in October? Yeah, Shane, that's a great place to start always. Um, summing up... Really, uh, the end of the month, uh, that was end of third quarter action. And really then what we need to look at is it kind of gives us an idea of how to set up for the fourth quarter end of year action, which is really important. And as we've observed, third quarter, and we've been through this whole third quarter in the last few episodes, it evidenced, and we were talking about this a lot, it was evidencing a massive swap of, sh we're talking about COMEX here, short open interest. We're talking about the chips in the casino moving, shuffling from the house into the speculators. And it resulted, with the speculators on the short side, and it resulted in a paper to physical disconnect not evident since gold was actually at $680 in 2000, June 2008. And this is interesting because it was interesting because in 2008, it was uh, the, the Bank of England that commenced QE after Lehman. And guess what? Last Monday, in came the fire hose, the QE fire hose. And you know it spooked everybody. These are all interconnected markets. And so we're expecting that fire hose, uh, QE fire hose, to go around the globe. But anyway, look, as we've been tracking as this third quarter progressed in silver, uh, the silver futures market, and this is something we were so concentrated on silver because it gave us the footprints. It became so disconnected from the real physical pricing fundamentals that the COMEX price setting mechanism completely broke. We talked about this. It was broken. And in the entire 50 years of the COMEX, we have never seen the house so long. I mean, when we say long, obviously, we mean, mean on, the, uh, on the bullish side of the, the, the expecting uh, a, a higher price against the blinkered speculators. And let's not forget uh, that the house market makers exposed to delivery obligations outside of the casino they had to tick for tick offset each freshly opened naked short borrowing of the chips with a long with a with, with in other words they were on the other side of that obviously betting against the speculators however while this offset um helps the market makers um leverage paper exposure to be covered inside the casino it nevertheless creates a lagging price divergence in the unleveraged physical markets outside of the casino, which the spot markets have telegraphed to us that there was something wrong. Now, hedge fund specs have no visibility outside the casino. They're blinkered to it. And if they did, 
they would sure as heck not have added the amount of naked shorts that they added. And we're starting to see a bit of the result of that. Now, the extraordinary backwardations that we witnessed at the delivery point for the September, remember we recorded the end of September, just going in into, into delivery at that point. And at the delivery point for the September silver contract, which then fed into the an unprecedented exchange for physical disconnect, i.e. the difference between what was happening inside the casino and what was happening in the real world, um, it's then mo moved into the December contract. We'd never seen such a condition before. It telegraphed to us that the final, final COMEX-driven capitulation point on September the 1st, which was, we'd already said at the time, at 17.5, that already we'd said that had to be the bottom for silver. And it turned out to be the bottom. However, gold futures became susceptible to really another month of follow through automated spec selling. Uh, and of course, the officials, uh, and, and we talked about the PSYOPs operation, are always run by officials into the engineered, inversely correlated rising dollar to gold futures. There's, there was a co there's a comic centric algo. We've talked about this algo that is set up to actually trick the specs every time the dollar rises to sell in the futures in, in the futures market to sell a, a gold and silver position. But bearing in mind, these are naked short positions. It's backed up simply by the other side of that trade of fiat dollar trade. So they're buying the dollar and they're selling gold and silver short and no idea what they're doing. This is inside of, a, of, of the, 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 the oxygen filled air of the casino. And, but this really perfectly set up the house casino insiders or the, man, or the pit managers for an unprecedented speculator options rinse, rinse as the October futures contracts were called into first notice. Now, first notice is simply where speculators who have bet either side of a contract are forced to either roll that over, close it, roll over, or pay up in full um, on their historical naked short bets against the house. Well, ahead and into first notice day on the 29th of September, uh, specs held a massive over 110 tons of naked short gold bets. I mean, hang on, we're talking 110 tons. It rolls off the tongue. But this is, if you imagine that in physical form, that is massive. And they held these naked short gold bets against just 1.4 tons of longs. So they weren't anywhere near hedged. 1.4 tons versus 110. Now, and guess, and guess who was on the other side of those bets? As in the case of every casino, of course, the house. And needless to say, speculators have no visibility into why the house, who have have visibility into the outside market, uh, into the wholesale markets, and they have no vi visibility as, as to why the house is betting against them. And blindsided, specs couldn't pay up into first notice. And the house disruptively as possible which they usually do on the other side of the trade. Usually when we, when, when we see a lot of specs long, they will disruptively pull the other side of that trade as disruptively as possible inside this little casino world to actually um, profit. And in this case, it was they pulled the shorts. They called in the loans uh, before the specs could exit these positions. It forced upside what we called air pockets and accelerated margin calls, i.e. they borrowed money off the house. And that, look, we'll look at that in more detail later. But Shane, I think it's best to look at gold and silver futures separately, as there was quite a divergence, if you remember. Yeah, yes, Andrew. And, and uh, w what's interesting is that'd be appreciated because we've had a ton of questions following you calling. I believe it's about six weeks ago. You, you called the sharks in to attack this extraordinary silver price disconnect. Maybe talk about about that here. Yes, I know, and it caused quite a storm because because a lot of people <laughs> were really like the idea of the sharks coming in and swimming into the back door of the casino, basically. Uh, and so, yeah, silver. Uh, of course, Shane, silver has been our focus, and I know it's been one of the subjects that you've enjoyed too, because being such a, a silver. 
uh, bug, may I call you. And we were certain that the silver price had made its final bottom on the 1st of September. And, and these are the things that told us it was so. And as far as silver is concerned, given um, even more recent liquidity provider feedback as of now, there is little doubt that the September 1st bullish turnaround we assessed simply had to be the bottom. Uh, and this was directly attributed to the extremely profitable risk-free arbitrage opportunity that we drew this public attention to here in Live from the Vault. And obviously we have a relationship with liquidity providers, which we've been talking to for some time about this trade, but by putting it public on Live from the Vault, and we have a lot of people coming in and looking at this, it, it began to be aggressively capitalized on by the sharks, attracted to this easy money the house had foolishly left on the table. And I can now reveal that these sharks consisted of very deep pocket Indian money, forcing the house to scramble to close this window a full month ahead of gold bottoming. Now, normally you would see gold and silver uh, moving in tandem. We saw this divergence. We saw this scramble. We saw silver rising and gold still coming down. And this risk-free arbitrage opportunity assisted in countering this massive accrual of automated speculator sellers who had for the entire third quarter, tick for tick, naked short sold, literally thousands, thousands of tons of undeliverable silver contracts into this rising dollar. Now, while it's not unusual, and we've seen this before, it's not unusual to evidence the Comex tail wagging the physical dog where backwardations, we've talked about them before, where the price of, of the futures market is below the price of the spot market, uh, you know, against the cash physical market, they can, they can coexist for extended periods of time. Historically, this rigged, dislocated, siloed trade was able to be contained inside the casino inside their, those walls, those protective walls, uh, providing the house the luxury of biding their time as they collectively reeled in more spec naked shorts that they knew that they were on the other side of. The house did not anticipate these card counters would enter the casino. And it, made, it really cheered me up to see this happening because we could see the footprints and the scramble. And having been woken to this untapped, extremely profitable risk-free arbitrage opportunity, these shark traders are now actively competing against the house. They're not going away. It's forcing them to ring the register on naked short specs far earlier than the house ever, ever intended. And having entered the casino through the backward-aided back door, this unwelcome card counting agnostic predatory money is playing by the house rules. So it can't be ejected by the casino. Now allowing the um, COMEX driven backwardations to reach these unprecedented extremes. Remember, we were mind blown, mind blown by, by the extent of them. It was a step too far for the greedy casino operators. And to be clear, this fresh competition is Agnostic to price, these guys are not saying we want a higher silver price. They're simply capitalizing on the divergences in the silver market. But by closing this arbitrage door before the house can ring the register on this herd of speculators, this competition uh, becomes very effective in draining the chips out of the casino, paper chips, ultimately raising the support floor which is really what we've been seeing. And it's important to understand that while this predatory trade objective is not to raise the silver price, simply capitalizing on this thousand dollar per contract risk-free arbitrage pocket, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it when we said it's a thousand dollars, guys. It's there for the taking. All you have to do is come in and just take it. But, but look, this as yet unrealized at the time uh, structural effect, that they imposed on the house is dramatic. The three months of permanently backward-aided conditions were reversed in just five single sessions, aggressively squaring the plain vanilla backwardation to par. In other words, they just rinsed the hell out of it. And what this has done is to impose some fresh, healthy competition against the house. Uh, these house insiders basically and though and, and through the process of osmosis this competition will serve to raise the price floor 
Before insiders have had the chance to cover the majority of the still outstanding 1,800 tonnes of double-counted ownership SLV shorts. Now, we've done a lot of work on why you shouldn't be trading an ETF, and there's going to be some really good uh, videos about this coming out that we just shot. But I mean, there's, it's so important to understand the difference between physical and, and a paper ETF where you do not own the physical. And it, it's an illusion, basically. Now, following the plain vanilla arbitrage leg being closed, these aggressive card counters have this week been capitalizing on every single backwardated tail wagging dip being driven by the blinkered naked short spec sellers. And what is of note, though, is having discovered how to card count this backwater opportunity, the next opportunity to assess um, inside uh, sort of the backwardated forward carry cross disconnect. So they're looking now, yes, OK, we've taken what's the easy money. Hey, but there's more here. And, and basically, they're saying that there's still really when you historically, there's still about 380 to $500 a contract. OK, in fact, we're seeing that now being even closed uh, in the last couple of days. We thought they being closed. But it, these guys are there. They're invigilating. They are acting as competition. It's never been there before, guys. That's what I'm trying to say. It's being capitalized on with hedges reluctant to use the technically backward to December uh, future contract for the last 60 days that's been uh, it's been impossible to use the resulting lack of paper market liquidity exposed the house to further competition and this this has now been closed but the card counters will add in some ongoing healthy competition for the house and I think that's the message we're trying to send here so with about eight weeks, seven and a half, eight weeks until first notice and delivery for the December contract, which comes at the end of November, when adding in the still arbitrable carry costs, i.e. the cost to, to hold that, store it, insure it, etc. in the COMEX, uh, and, and that this contract should historically be trading at a much higher premium than the current carry costs indicate. And there's still a very attractive risk brief of it. And now that the sharks are swimming inside the casino, the potential for also triggering a nickel-like short squeeze ended entirely on the cards. It was never factored in. And as this structural imbalance attracts more players, the incentive to force that nickel like short squeeze becomes extremely, extremely and increasingly likely. Well, Andy, I want to I want to just stick here for a second on this fresh competition uh, that we're talking about, because this is new. Uh, actually, it's been maybe the last six weeks. Uh, I'm thinking back. Uh, but how is this going to affect, for example, the SLV paper and the EFT flywheel, how it operates? Yep, and the flywheel, quite right, uh, uh, Shane, that is a flywheel, and that's what it is. So, um, But with, with deep enough pockets and, and very little duration risk into concurrent strong Indian and Chinese silver buying, that we've been talking about this massive Indian and Chinese silver buying, only just being reported now, even though at the time no one was mentioning it. Um, uh, and, and obviously, this includes very robust wholesale premiums that seem to have escaped the, the, the casino um, traders. Um, and obviously, we've been reporting that this arbitrable disconnect potentially sets up an, an we talked about this, an enveloping physical horn, the, the gatter physical envelop enveloping physical horn. Um, to trigger a physically driven rally that cannot be contained inside SLV. In fact, with far less opportunity to cash settle SLV shorts with this competition in the house, trying to discount silver futures to cash settle SLV shorts will drive backwardations, which will be slammed shut. So this is this is this is totally I mean again, it's not been realized yet by the speculators. But they will change. They will note the change in behavior at some point. So slamming the door on insider covering into a fast contracting window to cover 1800 tons of SLV shorts. I mean, unbelievable when you think about the, the scale of 1800 tons. I mean, we filmed. Do you remember we filmed in, in our uh, Liechtenstein vaults in Live from the Vault? And you remember, I think what we had about 30 or 40 tons in there at the time. 
and we were climbing all over it was stacked every can you imagine 1800 tons it means there will be far less physical silver to underpin each naked short sole comex ounce and while specs haven't realized this yet there's still one-to-one -one naked short selling silver futures into every tick of the rising dollar index. We can see the dollar index rising a bit today and then suck it in again. Insiders are forced to take the long side to hedge this exposure. And while the house is one-to-one -one, long against the specs, providing this one-to-one -one cover on the spec short sell position, what they can't counter is that COMEX centric fixed prices are being jumped on because they come out on the other end into a fixed price by competing physical buyers in the directly related 10 times larger spot markets. Now, global silver buyers understand why silver is grossly underpriced and that the backward nations are ultimately setting up the trigger for a tsunami of bid only short covering. It's inevitable. We talked about it last time. We've seen a couple of triggers of it. What is invisible to the lead by the nose, how hedge fund herd racing from dollar pillar to dollar post is that the silver futures are now in the nun club crosshairs, actively hunting for structural weakness between the casino and the global markets. This is not a siloed hunt brothers scenario that the house can call in. While this outside money has forced insiders to compete to close the immediate plain vanilla uh, spread that we talked about, it's been done well before insiders have had an opportunity to close all these SFO shorts, which still means there are actionable technical backwardations to capitalize on. Otherwise, we'd be seeing the, uh, a much larger uh, contango. In fact, Hedges are still not returning to the COMEX to hedge anything of long duration. Yes, short time, but not long duration due to the divergence of this exchange for physical spread from the historical norms. We should be seeing 20 to $26 contango. Historically, that's what we've seen. This technical backwardation, so really that we are seeing now, still poses them an unacceptable tail risk especially once the spec short squeeze is fully ignited. It will overnight revert to, uh, to the natural contango to these levels very, very quickly. So what we're saying is while the process of buying, then closing, you see, it, you get a negative effect initially because, because while the process of buying, taking delivery of the chips, then selling them to sell into the spot uh, for, uh, for foreign exchange markets, to simply lock in this easy arbitrage profit over the entire third quarter has temporarily capped the paper side of the markets. It, it has also structurally coiled silver into a very strong physical market where the Indian and Chinese buyers that we've been talking about have been more than keen to capitalize on, uh, on, on this um, discount. Um, with far less COMEX chips to short sell SLV against, the gap closed into the 27 and a half March highs and beyond is fully anticipated by all the liquidity providers we talked to, which means a tiny bit of patience is needed. We talked about it last time as this change in behavior plays out. A major spec driven short squeeze has yet to fully unfold. We've seen the first couple of legs of it. And we will evidence pullbacks, which we will today. Along the way, these are actually healthy consolidations, but dips that diverge futures far from spot will be competitively jumped on. Well, well, Andy, thanks for that uh, comprehensive update. And, uh, you know, we're talking about, I know for the last few weeks, the excitement and the energy is in silver because of what you're seeing in the market. But can you update our community on what's happening and what to expect in gold uh, over the short and let's call it medium term here? Yeah, Shane, um, in the larger picture, looking at gold, uh, geopolitically driven safe haven physical demand has been totally glossed over. It blows it blow, really blows most people's minds. They can't believe with, with some of the threats that are going on here that, that gold hasn't reacted. Now, there's a reason for that, because there's a psyops operation in place. Um, and so it's been glossed over. Um, and during this paper driven third uh, third quarter, COMEX driven action, we've seen that yet. The very large physical demands and large premiums over spot that we've been reporting have largely missed the mainstream media. Into a rising dollar, 
uh, gold priced in all other currencies has been very, very strong. Uh, physical gold, that is. And Bloomberg, for example, reported, I think, $44 ounce premiums in Shanghai. However, these premiums had exceeded $50 per ounce ahead of Golden Week starting this week and prompting credible reports that the import licenses in China will be brought forward. Well, that's going to suck an awful lot of physical gold back out of the market to fulfill these huge um, uh, to, to actually bring these that, that price back into par. Now, and that means raising the price. Now, ultimately, the, we've got to understand, people have to understand there's only one supply of available physical gold. People think of it in dollar terms as the only price. No matter which fiat currency is priced again, it's being actively drawn down into multiple jurisdictions and currencies, which in turn is tightening gold supply priced in dollars too. Now, these house-long foreign exchange spot gold positions against naked short speculators have exceeded levels not seen since 2008. And while this crisis is slightly different, with QE now instigated in the UK, and this will ultimately bleed through to Europe and the US, where we now anticipate both QE and lower, smaller rate hikes to provide some degree of credibility to coexist as this global contagion spreads. So really what we're saying is, forget, you know, QT is probably now reversing to QE. It has to. Someone has to buy these bonds. And this is extremely bullish for safe haven physical gold, where last week we evidenced pound gold reaching the equivalent of the 2000 March highs in US dollar price gold. I mean, so really, you just have to look across the, the whole picture. And just like when Russia's red line warning uh, to NATO were ignored prior to the March incursion, once again, far more serious nuclear warnings have been completely glossed over by the media as part of this psyops operation to block the race by comex centric fund managers to further rotate risk exposure into safe haven gold. This would have evidenced both the dollar index and gold to ride in tandem. That rise in tandem. That's what should have happened. That's what gold does when it's what it says on the box. But it's been it's been uh, manipulated by the officials to actually say, oh no, gold is never a safe haven. And that which is absolute rubbish because in the physical market we've seen the exact opposite. We've evidenced multiple officially driven PSYOPs operations to block gold demand into geopolitical driven safe haven moves. We've seen it over the years. However, it's always been affected by creating paper gold out of thin air <laughs> and then using this tidal wave of naked short sell orders to tamp down gold's natural appeal in times of uncertainty. Now, while this official containment has historically worked extremely well short term, Selling paper gold to buy paper dollars, stick saving risk markets while really simultaneously uh, painting a synthetic counterintuitive outcome for gold. What happened was Basel III NSFR standards have opened up this PSYOPs operation to central bank and sovereign buyers who've previously been blocked from taking physical delivery of paper derived prices. So consequently, under this wall of paper market supply hitting the COMEX market and in turn fixing the NSFR compliant deliverable FX gold market price, central bank and sovereign physical buyers sitting in very close proximity to the red line threat of nuclear warheads being employed have done the exact opposite to what these siloed COMEX traders are doing with liquidity providers confirming there is a concerted uh, move to secure real safe haven physical gold into this naked short paper supply. Now, the lag between leveraged paper market determined prices versus unleveraged but deliverable physical gold will be very much shorter than the market is expecting. Now, especially if we've seen some competition coming in. And given Basel III deliverability will force the physical delivery of competing central bank and sovereign accrued spot gold contracts, it will force 
this rapidly filling T plus T hopper. In other words, two days, spot market, you buy it, it's backed by NSFR conditions, you need to deliver that with two, in, within two days. So, and while silver doesn't have that, we have a competitor coming in now. But gold, we're talking about here, when this, when this, when these, these orders come through into the hopper, so to speak, and if anything that can't be uh, moved into the GLD converts, uh, which converts at the at the over there found kind of fixed leg, um, based on the Comex derived price, it's converted into physical. And at the margin, this will suck more liquidity out of the Comex. The tiny fraction of physical gold underpinning officially deployed. Um, registered gold will continue to force a scramble to short cover into naked short specs before the window closes. So we're still talking about gold here. And this week's Nord Stream Sabotage Act, you can blame who you want here, but we all know what happened here, adds to the recent major geopolitical escalations. And that's concurrent with China's fresh prepare for war Taiwan, Taiwan comments last week. They'd be completely obscured by the paper market's myopic focus on the rising dollar index and bond yield following the last FOMC. However, outside this siloedic oxygen rich in uh, casino, liquidity providers report that the as yet unfactored escalations, they will see the physical market premiums continue to rise substantially into very little available physical supply at current prices. It's just not there. Looking more immediately, though, Shane, uh, to answer your question more immediately, last week's unprecedented October options exercise structure, we looked at silver. That evidence, this is, this is mind boggling, I've never seen this before, 35,401 contracts short, in other words, puts, what they're called puts, for none traders, these are none delivery traders, these were short bets versus just 454 long bets. I mean, I've never seen such an imbalance ever, ever before. Uh, and, and they were being exercised into the expiry October non-delivery contract. Now, traders will know what this means, but we know these bets were held by the blinkered hedge fund herd, and they had no ability to finance these bets. They had no ability to, to, to make a stand and deliver them. They didn't have it. They just had paper warrants. And this provided us the clue that the House was going to commence an anticipated two-stage options exercise upside air pocket against these naked short specs in both gold and related silver. On the first leg of the short uh, rinse commenced right on cue last Wednesday, front running the upcoming first notice day deadline, whether we knew they couldn't take delivery. Uh, and the insiders, the house, just simply like they would on a rig table at the casino, they called everything and they just changed the odds, rigged the dice, did what they had to do. They anticipated, and it, what it did, this, the anticipated second leg of the house, uh, they did it in two stages, deliberately dis, dis, disruptive air pocket spec short rinse into first notice on Thursday. This was the actual day where they had to basically deliver or go away. And while this short rinse um, was partly assisted by uh, late market weakness in, 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 in dollar index, and you know, that obviously assisted, the house calling in these undeliverable options related specs held uh, short stops overrode early dollar index strength and turned both gold and silver futures into a buy the dip market. Now that's a huge change. Expect some pullbacks. Yep, yeah, we're going to expect some. We saw some today, but they will be shallow and we're evidencing a distinct change in behavior as we head into this quarter, which is the important thing to know. Now I've been waiting, we've been waiting for the carry through momentum driven sell the rally momentum to be arrested at some point. And while we anticipate inversely correlated spec algos to be drawn into short gold and silver into dollar rallies, which we're seeing today, we also realize that on the other side of that trade, the house sits on unprecedentedly large structural long positions against the specs, and they're going to continue to rinse them at their will, but only, but contained to the amount that they can dare push 
the uh, the, the envelope um, into a tight physical market. And this is partly evidence in the extremely stale dated COT reports, which we get every Friday, which are three days old, a ludicrous situation that they're still allowed in this picosecond world to, to, to delay information that's actually available to print on the end of every day. They delay it for three days, but it's a part of, it's a tool of the game. But in the larger picture, the last time we evidenced anything close to such a bullish house structure was the 2008 upside inflection point. And as was seen in 2008, we can once again expect safe haven gold to rise alongside safe haven dollar inflows because it's actually the, 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 the tail stops wagging the dog and the dog starts wagging the tail. And liquidity providers also report the strongest physical market since 2008. You can't ignore this stuff. Evidencing off the scale, strong German, in Asian and Chinese gold demand with the premiums over spot, the largest this year and increasing. And this will keep insiders exposed to the physical market one to one long against the spec sellers a hell of a lot quicker than they would have liked. So bottom line, following the heavy third quarter, we can expect a dip Myers market to return into the very tight for supply physical market in gold and silver during this quarter. Premiums are on a scale not seen since early COVID shortages triggered, triggered that March 2020 EFP implosion. And this is a reason for house insiders to ring the register on this massive spec held paper held in balance. And as Shane, as we always say, there's just one question and you know it is, we all know it, all our subscribers know it is, how much physical do you own guys? All right, thank you, Andrew McGuire. We're talking gold, and should I say, for the last little while, talking silver also for the benefit of our massive silver community out there. And remember, you know, this is information that you just can't get anywhere else. And so to our entire Live from the Vault community, buy physical and understand the difference between what Andy affectionately calls the casino paper and, and silver markets and the actual physical gold and physical silver markets. They're not the same. Don't be fooled. And there you have it. That's all we have for you today on another fascinating episode of Live from the Vault. Please help us spread the word about this channel by hitting that like button, not now, but right now. Uh, share this information with everyone you know, and don't forget to subscribe. If you click on that bell notification, you'll be notified as each episode goes live. And with that, we'll see you next time right here on Live from the Vault. See you then.